Uh, I think we're just about to begin, so... I wouldn't drink that, by the way. Oh, is this yours? Well, I drank out of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the way the format of the debate will work... Uh, sorry, the motion is morality without religion is bankrupt. Um, the way the debate will work is that uh, Alex and Keith will both give 10-minute speeches on either side of the motion. We'll start with Keith, and then we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes of general conversation and rebuttals between the two. Um, and then we will have about five minutes closing features between the two. And then we're going to have a, well, what looks like a very engaging Q&A after that. So um, if you're ready, yep. Keith, we'll <coughs> begin with you. Right. Well, uh, all three words, uh, morality, religion, and bankruptcy, are difficult. And I'll just say that there are many different sorts of religions. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are rather good. Uh, I'm going to limit myself in what I'm talking about to theistic religions. That's basically the Abrahamic group, uh, but uh, most of, most any religions might come into that as well. Uh, morality, I'm going to limit myself to a sort of um, quasi-utilitarian view that uh, the aim of morality is to be compassionate uh, to all sentient beings uh, and uh, ask about the relationship between these two things. Bankruptcy, I just take to mean that you have no resources to fall back on. <laughs> so the motion is that, uh, that I'm defending is that uh, uh, morality, uh, that is having a, a view that you should be compassionate for all sentient beings and, or love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, uh, the motion is that that, if it doesn't have a religious backing of some sort, and let's talk about theism, so that's not the only thing you could talk about, uh, without some theistic type backing uh, is without uh, important resources that it could have. I am not arguing that morality is impossible without religion. Of course it's not. Everybody has a morality of some sort, and there are different sorts of morality even within religion. So I've got to confine myself to, to one sort of uh, thing. And the thing I'm confining myself to, you'll find in John Stuart Mill, really, who uh, was, a, of course, well, was supposed to be a utilitarian. He wrote a, a an essay about it anyway, and uh, so that was concerned with the greatest happiness of the greatest number of sentient beings, I take it, uh, but also a theist, not an orthodox Christian, but somebody who thought that without belief in God, utilitarianism wouldn't work. Why did Mill think that? Because he didn't like people very much, really, so why should you care about other people, and why should you think that you should be compassionate to them when you actually disagree with most of them? And some of them are attacking you anyway, so uh, it's quite difficult to be compassionate. And Mill looked around him and he thought, no, I don't feel compassionate at all. So he thought there needs to be something that is a ground, for us, um, a resource for breeding compassion. And that's the view I want to defend. And I want to say, well, uh, you can have morality without that, but... Um, there's no particular reason why you should. I mean, if you say, I'm going to be compassionate to all the sen uh, sentient beings, that even sounds too extreme. I mean, you might want to say, most of my atheistic colleagues, of whom I have many, uh, in moral philosophy, they, they would say, oh, well, it's just a choice you make. Um, it's good to be compassionate, but I'm just saying that. My old teacher was Freddie Eyre, you know, a long time ago now, and he used to say, well, morality is just what you feel like, and you try to persuade other people to feel it, uh, as you do. Uh, so we express your feelings. Well, so the first question about morality is, is that an adequate account of morality, that it's the expression of subject to preferences? And I really think it's not. Uh, and uh, I'm one of those who think that there has to be an objectivity about moral values. That is to say, some things are intrinsically worthwhile. That is, they, they are worth existing just for their own sake, whether or not anybody thinks they are. And that's what I mean by objectivity. So there's a worthwhileness about some things, uh, certain sorts of happiness, there are all sorts of happiness, uh, and of course Mel qualified what he meant by happiness, uh, are intrinsically good, and it doesn't matter if nobody believes that, they're still intrinsically good. So there is truth. So here's a philosophical claim, which of course you can dispute, but I'm certainly uh, assuming, uh, and lots of arguments for it, that there are objective moral values. And I'm pleased to say quite a lot of philosophers are now saying this and calling themselves extended or enriched naturalists. The 
like the word naturalist because it says there's nothing supernatural. Um, a more restrictive definition might be uh, it says that things are true if they're amenable to experimental observation. But if values are not amenable to experimental observation, so an enriched naturalist, I'm quite happy to be an enriched naturalist, would be a person who said no values are objectively real. And the problem then, philosophically, is how do you fit that into a naturalistic view? You're obviously not going to be a person who says nothing is true except the things that science says is true are true. There are other things, uh, and one of them is it's true that you should not torture innocent children. If you think it's true, I think there is a philosophical question is, is there anything that makes it true? Some philosophers would say things can be true, but nothing makes them true. That doesn't make sense to me. I think if something is true, something must make it true. So the question is, what is it? So that's step one. Uh, for morality to be important to me, for it to be the case that I ought to be compassionate to all sentient beings, I have to think that it's true, even if I don't like people. It's still true I ought to be compassionate. So where does that ought come from? What's the normative force of that? Well, uh, I proceed from there. That's step one. There's an objectivity about moral values without which you couldn't make my arguments at all. But the second step is to say, well, um, what, is, what is the best uh, uh, thing that would make a moral value true? Well, I think the, the nearest, the best analogy I can think of is a personal thing. That is, if you love a person, an ordinary human person, you will feel that they exert a normative pressure on you. There are things that you ought to do because they are just lovable. They are, in your eyes, and they are desirable. People can love the wrong things, but presumably, if there's a god, then uh, that god is a personal being. I'm taking this. That god is a personal being who is infinitely desirable. So assuming that, if there were a personal being who is infinitely desirable, then that would give you a good reason for doing what that being thought you ought to do. And of course, if that God was infallible, so God knew what was true, God would know what you ought to do because that would be a truth about what there is. The old Euthyphro dilemma is not a serious dilemma at all because all you have to do is what St. Augustine did and say, well, the necessary truths of morality are indeed necessary. They could not be other than they are, and they are parts of the nature of God. They're not something external to God, which limits God, they're part of the divine nature. And if somebody doesn't think that, then they've got a different idea of God than I, or most Christians, uh, theologically speaking, have had. So that's that step uh, to say objective values, a good resource uh, for believing that, a thing that would make them true and normative, binding on you, is if they were a personal being who knew what was true, what was necessarily true, and actually made it binding upon you. Uh, how you find out what that God thinks is a different question I'm not dealing with. And you'd find out in general in the same way that you work out what, are, what it is good to do. All right, it's the same sort of question, because you're actually defining God in terms of the best that you can think of. So you're not getting all your moral values straight from God. That's a very primitive view. Uh, you're actually assessing what God is in terms of your moral values. But that will make a difference to your moral values because you'll say my moral values have a grounding, a resource in something that is true about the universe and that's what I'm trying to find out even though it's difficult to find that out and people will disagree about it. Right, one more step that I want to take is that uh, not only is there a moral demand which is rooted in the nature of things but that moral demand uh, uh, has consequences. And uh, I now move from Mill quickly to Immanuel Kant, who said, though not everybody knows this, <laughs> but Kant certainly said, without belief in God, morality is impossible. So I'm following Kant in this. Uh, so the argument is rather subtle. It is, of course, you sort out what is right and wrong by thinking, by universalizing, by thinking what uh, a dispassionate and loving and good observer of the universe would say ought to happen. So you work that out for yourself. But unless you think there is such a being, there's no reason why what you work out should be binding upon you. You say, well, yes, hypothetically, 
Uh, if, I, if I was in a dispassionate observer of the universe, I'd say, yes, everyone ought to love everybody else. That's what I'd say, and you know, I'd tell them they ought to. But actually, I'm not a dispassionate being, uh, right? So the, the categorical imperative of Kant, that you ought to do whatever is universalizable, has no personal force if you say, why should I do what is universalizable? Is there a reason for doing that? If I can't, of course, he just thought it was obvious. I assure you it's not obvious. There are not many people who actually believe it. As Mill said, most people are horrible. Right? Most people are not going to say, I ought to be moral. I mean, the world is full of people who don't want to be moral at all. And in fact, they use morality as an excuse for being self, selfish and self-aggrandizing. So do religious people. I'm not, I'm not saying religious people are better than non-religious people at all. I'm talking about the resources there are for defending a strong view of morality as a normative. So the strong view is this, that in the end, you think the good will triumph. That's a hope. It's a religious hope, although you, you might not belong to a, a particular Christian sect, for example. But one might want to say, uh, Sorry, just, uh, act, may we is that 10 minutes? 10 minutes right? Great, yeah. So last sentence then, if you think that your moral action will not succeed, it will fail in view of what the world is like, you will lose your motivation to be moral, and in that sense, God is a good resource for keeping your moral motivation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
to be uh, a, a function of religious morality that cannot be, by definition, a function of atheistic morality. But not only do we need to see that uh, there is a potential quality of religious morality that succeeds, but that this is the only possible basis for a non-bankrupt system of ethics. If there even remains a plausibility of some other kind of grounding for objective or subjective ethics that is not bankrupt, then the motion uh, must fail. Now, I'll, I'll press this. What this means is that uh, for the motion to carry, Professor Ward needs to demonstrate either the quality that is true of all atheistic morality that universally fails, or the quality that exists only in religious morality that cannot exist in atheistic morality and is the only possible basis on which morality can be grounded. I think you'll agree that this is no easy task, even for a philosopher of uh, Keith's caliber, which is why I'm quite excited to hear um, how he might go about doing this. But since I've got a little bit of time left, um, like I say, I don't have to convince you of any superiority of atheistic or secular morality. But I think that there are some co considerations that we should be thinking about while mulling over uh, the motion in our mind. Why is it, for instance, that in the course of moral progress, it has almost invariably been religion that stands in the way? Why can those who wish to continue condemning homosexuals, continue uh, condemning and denigrating women, continue scaring children with threats of eternal punishment, so reliably turn to religion and their scriptures for authority and guidance? Now, on the ontological point of morality, this is not to say that it's impossible that we've just it's impossible that we've just continually misinterpreted God or the will of God, um, which, and, and it's the God that ultimately grounds morality, and it's uh, just that we've misunderstood him, and it just so happens to be the case that the great secular uh, moral strides of history, almost invariably being made against religious opposition, have just kind of happened to hit on what God meant all along, um, and we've just misunderstood him. But we have to ask ourselves... What is more likely? Right? And not only that, but even if God has always been right all along, religion, which is what we are debating, of course, certainly has not been, with a pretty terrible track record of advocacy for slavery and misogyny and homophobia. Now as we're beginning to realize as well a disregard for the lives of uh, non-human animals. And when the moral enlightenments of the secular age begin to dismantle these one by one, when they say that, no, we think that Paul was actually wrong in 1 Timothy 2.12 to say that women should be silent and not allowed to teach, that Muhammad was wrong to marry a six-year-old and consummate the marriage at nine years old, that Moses was wrong to permit sexual slavery of the Midianites in Numbers 31, um, I think it's quite a claim uh, and quite insulting to those who have lost their lives fighting for the cause of secular reason and progressive morality against this kind of religious insanity and the victims of the latter as well to say that after all its initial opposition it is in fact religion that can now take the credit for the justification of uh, the moral beliefs that finally ended this kind of historical misery to say that the secular progressives of women's rights and gay rights and transgender rights and animal rights and the rest were merely channeling what religion had kind of been getting at all along and or were bankrupt moral systems unless and until they were endowed with the divine seal of approval uh, is more than just a mistake. I, it, it comes across to me as uh, almost malicious. Um, I think that, it, 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 to me, it seems as though it is the, the essence right, of a bankrupt moral system that it so consistently has to take its lead from those who've rejected its most fundamental premise, rejected that God and his scribbling should be the, the foundation of our moral system. Religion, as it has been said, when right about things is right by accident, the moral codes that it consistently promotes are either trivially true or trivially awful. I mean, leaning on such revolutionary moral propositions as it's not a good idea to kill, don't steal, um, treat each other nice as you want them to, to treat you nice too, leaning on these kind of moral platitudes that attempts to hide in their shadow um, some of, a, a number of other propositions that it promoted that are as obviously wrong as those propositions are obviously right. Even if you think that God is needed to ground morality, which I don't think is the case, I think that any benevolent God can only look with horror upon what uh, religion has done uh, to promote uh, or, or to counter the cause of moral progress in the world. Um, that is why I think that not only is this motion that religion, uh, that morality without religion is bankrupt is wrong, I think it's exactly wrong because I think it's religious morality that is truly bankrupt and we can discuss why that's the case. Uh, but we could potentially say that although religion has historically been wrong on these points, religion then was wrong, but religion now is right 
about what was wrong back then. Okay, we could say something along these lines. We could say that we need some kind of ontological divine basis for our morality. And so we can say that now we have that basis to kind of look back in history and say that they'd gotten it wrong in the past. But remember, we're trying to find a stable basis for our ethical considerations. And I think that the uh, track record of catch-up being played by religion historically and the track record of uh, innovation and cogency provided by secular morality and moral progression should incline us to take the latter course. But I'll remind you that even if you don't think the same thing, even if you uh, don't think that atheistic secular morality has provided a superior uh, alternative to ground our ethics in than religion historically and does so now today, uh, that doesn't actually matter. All that I need to do is to convince you of its plausibility, that it's at least not impossible for there to be some kind of functional system of morality grounded in an atheistic worldview. If that's the case, then at the very least what we have is two contending propositions about how to, uh, how to go about our ethical thinking. And unless it can be shown that there is something universal about atheistic morality as a whole that fails, then the motion must fail too, I think. And that's about all I've got. Professor Ward, do you have any comments? You oh, certainly, yes. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> there's not time to go through the whole history of um, moral progress, mm. but I think it's... Uh, just uh, really uh, a legend that uh, religion has always opposed such things as infanticide uh, and uh, slavery and uh, the equality of men and women. Uh, that, that's just a fantasy and it depends. I mean there are religious people who do believe all those nasty things that you mentioned. Um, there have always been religious people who don't. And I think one of the problems is when you mention the word religion, a bit like um, uh, my colleague Richard Dawkins, <laughs> you think of all the worst things that religions have done and you say, oh, that's what religion is. When you talk about secularity, you don't look at North Korea or at Russia or at China and see the terrible things that actual atheistic uh, governments have done to, to their populations, murdering them by the million. So I think it's a much more complicated uh, story, and I would say, I don't want to go into the whole history, but for example, in uh, Poland was, I think, saved from Soviet domination by a pope, and uh, uh, John Paul II uh, heroically fought for um, the, uh, the, the rights of the Polish peoples. But on the other hand, you can find, you know, both in much secular morality and religious morality, bad things. So I think it's a mistake, really, to, to pick on the bad things and say, ah, the bad things are all in religion and the good things are all in secularity. You ask, take gays. Uh, when I was young, there weren't any gays, you know, we didn't have them. People lived together and we knew that. But well, No, but we did have them, but they, we wouldn't have known about it because they were so uh, scared to say yeah, that they were gay. We didn't use the word. The word wouldn't have been used. Yeah, but why, why not? Why, like, th this is what why I'm not? talking about. Like, like, but also, I just, I just before, we, before we move on, no. I, I, want, I want an opportunity to respond to what you said. Perhaps we have a different understanding of what the word secular means. I mean, to me, the word secular means, in fact, I think the dictionary definition of secular is not involved in religious affairs. Right? It, it, it does not have a hand in religious affairs. To say that a government is secular is to say that it has no religious leanings. A, a government that, critis that, that far, far more than criticizes, but um, punishes atheism, puts atheists to death, put people to death for being the wrong religion, for instance, uh, a country that... Um, that is uh, actually, uh, I, I mean, to say that if the Soviet Union is putting people to death because of their religion, that's the least secular thing imaginable. How can we say that a system like that, that is killing people on the basis of religion, is secular, if to be secular is to not have a hand in religious affairs? Well, it's certainly, um, when it was communist, it was certainly atheistic in principle. And if you believed in God, you wouldn't get promoted uh, and you would get sent to a camp. Mm. Uh, and Christians are certainly persecutors throughout the world. I mean, one of the greatest Absolutely. instances of, of persecution now is the persecution of Christians by non-Christians. Yeah. And you, you think, well, um, so what, what's, uh, what's bringing that about? It's, uh, is that another religion? Or it's just what I was going to say about gays, <coughs> rather, that we wouldn't have called them gays, but mm. we called them homosexuals. And, but... Um, if you say which people in the British society now are most opposed to homosexuality, 
It is not the religious. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of religious people are opposed to homosexuality, I agree. A lot of us are not, very definitely not. Uh, but the people I meet in pubs <laughs> who hate gays and will bash them are not religious people. I mean, they're, they're just people who have very perverted moral views. Yeah, sure, but where can they look to for their moral authority on that point? If they look to any kind of secular moral system that's, of, that, that's, that's sprung up in the past hundred years, then they're not going to be able to find it, whereas if they turn to religious scripture, it's going to be right there for them. No, well, uh, if I'm not defending the views of any Christian church in England at this moment, as they stated officially, I'm opposed to that, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's where I don't want to mix up religion, that is a particular social organization at a particular time in history with belief in God. Yeah, well, neither do I, but I mean, no. that was the motion that I was presented with. Um, okay, uh, but I'm, yeah, you had the word religion, we both had the word religion, and of course that put me uh, in a uh, sort of state of panic for a start, because my lecture one on religion is that you can't define it, <laughs> right? So it's, it's very difficult to say, uh, uh, recently a high court judge decided that uh, ethical veganism had the state of status of religions and you think well uh, that's pushing it a bit as far as I'm concerned but so the boundaries of religion are, are not just limited to some Christian sects and denominations right absolutely but in the same yeah. way like the, this is this is the thing that the kind of point scoring won't work here if, if, if like from, from either of us um, I think we can agree that whilst all secular governments are kind of atheist in, in the sense of not having a, a religious motivation. No, it's, it's, not, all atheists, it's not that, Alex. It's not that. Not all North atheist Korean government is, is opposed to any religious view. Sure, no, I agree, but, but, it, yeah. but it, as I was about to go and say, not, it, not all atheist regimes are secular. You can have an atheistic regime that's non-secular. You can have an atheistic regime that's evil and doesn't, can, uh, doesn't uh, abide by any kind of moral system that any of us would think is acceptable. But that's not endemic to, uh, to atheism in the same way that if I point to some kind of Christian theocracy and say that you can say that that's not endemic to Christianity, absolutely true. So what we're talking about instead is atheism and religion, not any particular form of atheism or any particular form of religion. Yeah. And so I think that we need to see some reason to believe that atheism, yeah. as, as simply the rejection of a belief in God, somehow completely eliminates the ability to have moral thought. Yeah, well, on the word secular, uh, a colleague of mine, Stephen Law, who is uh, quite a well-known atheist, I think, and I think he's the president of the British Humanist Society, or the secretary. Anyway, he's written a book on humanism, what it is, and he explicitly says, I've argued with him about this, <laughs> what he says in his book on humanism is humanism is anti-religious. Yeah, but I'm not here defending humanism. I'm not, I'm not a humanist myself. Okay. All right. So, but, but this is the thing, right? So, so if we have a motion that says that without religion, morality is bankrupt, it's like, yeah, you, you can point to North Korea, you can point to the Soviet Union, you can point to Stephen Law if you like, yeah. but what we should be talking about is atheism. Atheism is a, is a lack of belief in God, and I'm right. yet to see a good reason to see why that should okay. preclude the ability to have moral propositions. Right. Well, if we're just talking about atheism as a, as a view of the world, um, then I think we're not discussing what harm either religious or so-called secular moralities have done to the world. We're talking about a theoretical position that um, whether you think there is a supreme creator of the world who is good or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're talking about that, then I think there is something that atheists lack, that theists have, and probably don't want, I mean, atheists probably don't want it. And that is a resource for making morality intelligible as, as a commitment that you might make. So suppose I, uh, I want to say, why should I, why should I support uh, uh, people that I disapprove of and I don't like? Um, why should I do my best to care for their well-being? I probably... If, uh, if I didn't think there was a God who <laughs> told me that I had to, I probably wouldn't. Now, that might sound rather personal, but I think a lot of people feel like that. And it's in that sense that I think people who want to know what sort of morality to follow also want to know, is there any reason for following it? And that's what atheists, I think, lack. I mean, there so isn't so a reason. So in other words, uh, a, a religious, religious person who takes the same persuasion as yourself might think that the reason why I want to do a good act is because I'm being told to, whereas yeah. someone like myself can say that the reason I want to do a good thing is because I believe it to be good. And again, we're trying to discuss which of these is the bankrupt moral system, and I think that, like, there's no contest there. Well, uh, you're, you, what you're doing is 
you as an atheist would say that something's good because because you believe it to be good. My, my point is, what's the basis of your belief that it's good? Is Absolutely. it just your so, intuition? Yeah. So we need to talk about what, what is the standard of good. And this is why yeah. I wanted to bring you back to the Euthyphro dilemma, which you mentioned. Right. And I, I wanted to just clarify your answer to, to anybody who's not familiar. Uh, in Plato's Euthyphro, the question is asked, are things good because God commands them, or does he command them because they're good? And I, yeah. what would your... What would your answer to that question be? Uh, straightforwardly, it was Plato's answer that God commands things because they're good. Okay, so what that indicates to me is that if God commands things because they're good, there is a standard of good that exists outside of God, because good becomes a, 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 a property of something that exists independently of God, because to say that God no, does that, something because uh, it's good. That's the way the dilemma is put, but actually the religious response to that, mm -hmm. or uh, the theistic response to that, is to say that there is a standard of goodness. It is necessarily what it is, but it is internal to God. Okay. Uh, so you define God in terms of good. So I, I'm, right, I see, I'm yeah. with you I, if you're saying you know what is good independently of God. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And uh, So you do know what is good independently of God. Okay. I, when, when you say that, you mean we can have a conception of good that is separable from the notion of God? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I do. Uh, there's no argument. I, I I concede that straight away. Sure. But my question is, why should anybody care about that? Exactly. But the, but the same question could be asked of you, right? If you say that good is kind of a descriptive um, property of God, you, it, it's like saying that it, it's kind of a it's a property that belongs to something, like redness belonging to a table, right? Oh. There, there's nothing in a descriptive quality like redness that has any normative function. And similarly, why should uh, a descriptive quality of goodness, as applied to God, have any kind of normative function? I could ask, I okay. could return well, the question uh, to you and say, why ought I yeah, do what God commands? Yeah. It's a good philosophical point, but uh, which I disagree with, because if you say no descriptive property can have normative force, um, then if I said this room is on fire, yeah, it would have pretty immediate normative force. I, I disagree with you. It's, disagree? Oh, yeah, you, you don't you, just sit here and say, well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, of course, you need the hidden premise that we ought to avoid burning rooms. Yeah, we don't, well, okay. Well, we, we may not need it to react upon it. Like, we may not need it instinctively, is what I mean to say. But in order to philosophically justify why you should leave the room, uh, if you just said, well, the building's on fire, and I could just say, well, why should that mean we need to leave? It's like, well, we need to avoid being hurt. Okay, why do we need to avoid being hurt? You need the, you need the normative premise that we, should evolve, or that we should avoid pain, that we should avoid burning alive, something like that. Yeah. Without that, you don't get philosophically to the end of saying no. we should leave the room. But many descriptions... Uh, involve in themselves a normative premise. I can say, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. well, that's a description of what I am, but it's in itself normative. It means I want some food, and I'd be stupid not to try and get some food if I could. Now, so, now, now hold on. You can say that saying I'm hungry is equivalent to saying I want some food, okay, but that still is just a descriptive statement. I want some food, okay. Why ought you do what you want? I don't agree with... Um, separating off the normative from the descriptive. The case I used in my 10-minute introduction was loving a person. Mm -hmm. And you may say that uh, this is a person I love, and I love, and that's a descriptive statement, I love this person. But if it's true, you don't appeal to a premise that I ought to do what people I love tell me. You don't appeal to that you automatically do it. Yeah, you may, it. you may not appeal to it, but it needs to be there implicitly. Yeah. In well, order I don't to have disagree with that. I'm just that saying um, that saying there is a God yeah. is saying there is an objective moral standard of goodness. That's part of what you're saying. And if you want to say that's separate from a description of God, well, all right. But the norm is built into the description. We, well, I, I, still, I still disagree with the point. I, I think, yes, you can say that God is uh, or, or provides... I, well, I suppose it wouldn't provide because, again, it's independent, but God has this objective kind of quality of goodness. But the yeah. question still remains, why ought you do what is good? And now, I, I don't necessarily think there's an answer to this question, but I'm saying if the criticism of atheistic morality is that you have no reason to believe why you ought to act in a certain way in accordance with a certain normative fact, yeah. then I could say the same thing to you. If, if I have no reason on an, in the same way that if I said, well, my atheistic morality is based upon if this room caught in fire, well, we all know that we should leave the room. You know, it's obvious we should ought to leave the room. Then you would quite rightly say, but there's no 
ontological basis for that. That's just your instinct, right? What's the actual philosophical uh, meat of, of the argument that we should leave the room? And I just want yeah. the same thing from you. Well, I, um, if you're thinking about uh, a personal being, you say there is a personal being who loves you, like one Christian view of that. There is a personal being who loves you, who cares for your good, and can, is able to bring about that your good will be fulfilled. Mm. Now you then say, that doesn't give you a reason for doing what that being says to obtain the good that that being promises. So you need, you're saying, you need an additional normative premise. You ought to do what is... Uh, um, what, how would you put it? How I suppose put it, it breaks norm? down to saying you ought to do what is good. No, it's not just that, because it's just, it's not that the being is good, it is, is that the being holds out the possibility of good for you, so you, you've got a, uh, a future Sure, so why, ought, so why ought I do what's good for me? Well, there's a, there's a, there is a, a, a state where you have to say there is an ultimate thing which seems reasonable to most reasonable people, right? that's true. Right, well, I mean, it doesn't seem too reasonable to me. It, 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 it doesn't seem reasonable. That, that, on, if, on, the, a, on a philosophical... If there was somebody who really loved you a lot and yeah. cared for your good, well, say a parent, and they mm. were a good parent and they cared for you, yeah. uh, and you might then say, well, um, they advise you to do something when yeah. you were very young, at least, sure. and then it would make sense to do what they said because you knew that it was for your good. Yeah, because of the hidden premise that I ought to do what my parents tell me. Well, yes. Something yes. evolutionarily instilled within us in the same yeah. way that if I hear a noise ruffling behind me, I'll probably jump, right? But if I were to yeah. actually philosophize about it, like, it, it seems unreasonable to jump at every noise that's ever made, yeah. right? And what we're talking about is not what we would do in any given situation, not whether we would leave the burning room, no. not whether we would trust our no. parents, but whether we should. Yeah. And not only am I, uh, am I not hearing a reason that the religious can prevent to kind of escape the same criticism of atheistic morality, of, of providing a reason why we ought to do what is good in that sense, I'm also not seeing a reason why atheistic morality is different from religion in this sense, in such a way that it universally fails. Because again, like, we, could, we could talk about this for a very long time, and you, we could just kind of agree that maybe there is some kind of normative function to descriptive facts. Maybe, maybe there is just something there. But then all we've shown is that religious morality is coherent. Right? We still yeah. have, we still have the, entire, uh, the entire motion in front of us, which is to say that without that religion, you cannot get that same kind of normative function. And if I grant you that the normative function is a product of descriptive facts, then I can do the exact same thing and say that a descriptive fact like pleasure just contains the normative function that we all ought to act in accordance with our pleasure. Yeah. Right? I can do the same thing as you. Now, then we would just have two equally competing moral worldviews, but there's no reason to say that the atheistic one is any more bankrupt than the religious one. Well, I, def I, I define bankruptcy as not having resources that you would add to the statement, I'm doing it because it's good. I am agreeing you should do things because they're good. And I think you should, and I admire people to do. But the question is, are there intellectual resources which would make that more intelligible in the world? And so is, is morality built into the way the world is, or is it just, as one of my uh, colleagues says, a con game played on us by evolution. So we think, uh, as Freud himself suggested, that um, moral, uh, the sense of moral obligation is a hangover of your super ego and uh, some things that happened to you in your infancy with your father. But actually, you shouldn't take any notice of that because you should get rid of that as pathological. So that, there are people who argue seriously that morality is a con. In fact, Philippa Foote, who is very well known in this university, uh, argued that morality is a con in the sense you've just got to get people to believe that uh, you should do it. Yeah. But, and there's, there's no reason for it. Well, I, I think you can provide a, 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 a person who believes there is a God has a reason for doing what is good. And part of the important thing of that reason is that the good is actually possible. There's a being who says do this can bring it about that good is successful. Whereas in the world, at my age, I can tell you, <laughs> that's a, I'm using my ageism here to make a point, but that when you try to do good, it usually doesn't work. It makes things worse. Right. Uh, that is very dispiriting. And in the end, you think, well, I've been trying to do good all this time, like a politician, a prime minister who tries their best to do what's good and they all fail. And you think, well, nothing's going to work, really. So, so let's just go for power. And that's what 
generally happens. And I think a belief that there is a, uh, a good and loving God would actually ought to, ought to relieve you of that sense so that uh, you give up on trying to be good and you go for power. Okay, look, so we have, we have examples of atheists who think that morality is a con. Yeah. Fine, sure, they exist. We have examples of people who have warped conceptions of morality. Okay, fine, they exist. But what is it that is essential to a lack of belief in God that necessarily brings about that kind of warped view of morality? Uh, I, well, that, that there is simply that there is no reason you can give for doing what is good apart from the fact that you choose to do it. Okay, so then the reason, I mean, I, well, I would say that there are many atheistic systems, that, that atheistic mora moral systems that say that there are such reasons, but let's say that even if that's the case, does that criticism not just apply to you in the same sense, right? Well, like, no, because... What, what reason do we have yeah, to act okay. in accordance with what God is commanding? Even if we determine it to be good, what reason do we have to be good, right? I've, I've spoken with a lot of people about, for instance, pleasure-based moral systems. You yeah. bring up John Stuart Mill and, and, and mention that he's a theist, but the thing that was so great uh, about John Stuart Mill is that regardless of whether he was a theist or not, he attempted to provide a moral system that didn't rely upon that theistic background, right? That's kind of the, that's, that's yeah. the, the essence of the point that he would, that he would have put forward. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people about this and, and talking about how pleasure might be reducible, uh, morality might be reducible to pleasure, and people say, well, no, I mean, we should do what's good and God determines what's good. And it's like, well, why should you not, why, why should you follow what God says you should do? And you say, well, because you'd have no reason to if you didn't, as you're saying, if you don't act in accordance with that, then you'll be going to hell. If you, if you act in accordance yeah. with it, then you'll go to heaven and, and you'll be able to live kind of in harmony with God. And it's like, well, why do you want to live in harmony with God? Well, because it will be pleasurable, of course. It's like, it, it, it breaks down to the same thing. What I'm looking for is something within God that gives us reason that we ought to do what's good that cannot exist on a naturalistic worldview. Well, partly it comes out of what you mean when you say something is good. You say, I, I choose to do something because it's good. But I would then ask, what do you mean by saying it's good? Do you mean that's what you prefer? I think that's what atheists should mean. I mean, they don't, they don't on the whole, or would you be an atheist who thinks there actually is a property of goodness that things possess, well, independently of what humans think? Well, we have to be careful here, because of course I prefer w what's good, but I don't think that's my definition of what's good, in the same way that you would presumably prefer what's good, but that's not what you're using to define good, right? Right. So what, what would you say is, is the definition of good, well, that, I, that would provide a kind of um, justifiable basis for an ethical system? I would want to say, in opposition to quite a lot of moral philosophers, uh -huh. that when I say something is good, I mean it is true that it's good, even if I don't agree with it. Okay, but, but okay, but all you're doing there is just saying that, that objectivity needs to be, be part yeah. of the definition of good, yeah. but you still haven't defined what good is. I'm not sure what you'd be asking. Like, like if, I, if I were asking you to define blue and you said, well, that's easy, I mean, blue is something that is objectively blue whether people believe it is or not. It's like, that, that doesn't tell us what blue is. No. Uh, so what is so what is good? Well, there are lots of attempts to define. I would just say something is good if it is intrinsically worthwhile. If it is worth existing for its own sake. Okay, so so you you you've got an ultimate statement here. You say some things, and pleasure is one of them in itself. Uh, without going into what sort of pleasure it is, pleasure is in itself something that is worth existing. It's better than its alternative. Uh, okay. It really is good, even if some people don't think so. But if that's the case, then I can construct a system of ethics based upon pleasure that doesn't require God, that is therefore that, that is then not bankrupt. Right. But right. if you get to that stage, you then have the pretty severe problem of saying, what do you mean by saying that statements about goodness and badness are objectively true? I mean, what is it about the universe that makes them true? Because... Most people of my acquaintance would say, actually, there's nothing about the universe that makes moral statements true. That's just what you choose. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> well, that's their view, and that's fine. They're welcome to it. I'm, I'm interested in, like, for, for a start, do you think that subjective moral worldviews are bankrupt? Because there's, uh, there's a long and rich history of subjective uh, morality. There is, yes. 
And are, are you kind of saying... There are all here, sorts of morality. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, are you saying I'm, that there's... I'm just... I didn't choose the word bankrupt, but I'm using the word okay, bankrupt. I chose the word bankrupt. I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> that's my, maybe, maybe you should have phrased it better. I'm, just... I'm using the word bankrupt in the sense of there are no other resources that you can call on to make your view, to make it intelligible that you should actually do what is good, what you know to be good. Now, uh -huh. I agree, you know something to be good. And the question for me and for Mill and for Kant and for lots of other people is, all right, I know I ought to act universalizingly, but why the hell should I? And you say, because it's good. Well, that's bankruptcy. You say, you're not giving a reason. Whereas if you can say, because the universe is such that you're, you're trying to do what is good, will produce good consequences, not for you necessarily, but in general, good consequences. That is, it's not a waste of time to try to be good. Okay, so... Let me, let me clarify this. I don't, I don't want to bore the audience here, and we'll open it to Q&A in a minute maybe, but yeah. Yeah, do you think that there can be uh, naturalistic truths, descriptive truths, that are intrinsically motivating, that are intrinsically prescriptive, that, have, that contain within them somehow motivation to action? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so if we can have that in naturalistic descriptive facts, then we don't need any kind of divine divine intervention here okay. in order to have motivation, motivative, um, prescriptive facts. That. And that. that is the essence of morality. Facts that are prescriptive. Well, Ideas, uh, truths uh, that I give us reason to act in a certain that's the way. essence of morality. Like, I would want to feel, and I've actually been faced with this problem in real life, um, that I can know what good is, and I, could, I can know what I ought to do, and I'm quite clear about that. Um, but I can't see why that should be important to me, right? Um, if I thought, as I used to think, in fact, that I'm an evolutionary accident and that uh, all my beliefs are actually just produced by my brain and are not really under my personal control, so I have a completely naturalistic account of what I do, I would personally come to think, well, my feeling that I ought to do something is not rationally based. I've got it, but I can explain it in evolutionary terms of uh, things that were beneficial for the community in prehistoric times. Right? So if I can give a good explanation of that, I can actually get rid of a lot of my moral beliefs, and that's what worries me. I, I, and I know people who actually argue this. I'm not saying all atheists do, but if you're an atheist, it's difficult to find that sort of backing for the intelligibility of morality. You, know, you just say, well, it's there, it's good. So what? Maybe uh, difficult but not impossible, and it's equally hard, I think, to, for, for a religious person to do as well. And, and I'll, I'm just, like, what we are debating here is whether we can have morality without God. And oh, yes, we can. No, I'm, I agree with that. You can have morality without God. Absolutely. I, I've got no problem with that. I'm just saying the morality that a lot of people have now is... Uh, a sort of hangover from a religiously based morality. Sure. Can we open it? A uh, absolutely. Now? I mean, fine, sure thing. A very engaging debate. So, have you got any... <laughs> so, have we got any burning questions? Yes. Um, well, I'd like to say a very impressive debate from both of you. Um, I kind of thought it was kind of interesting that much of your debate centred around this notion of objective morality, sort of the is or of somehow extracting normative power from ultimately a descriptive purpose. And so I kind of got one question for each of you. So first of all, first, I suppose so you're kind of, if I understood you correctly, saying that one resource that theists intrinsically possess to fall back on justifying their morality that atheists don't is the fact that there is a god, a personal god, who possesses a sort of intrinsic property character, kind of no, knowledge of and in some ways part you know, uh, of substance with kind of objective moral truths about the world. Yeah. And that that resource is not available to uh, atheists. Except that I was kind of wondering that a lot of what you might describe about the kind of utility of that, so that why God is good, you could say that, okay, so God possesses intrinsic moral truths about the world, possesses knowledge of intrinsic moral truths about the world, 
and God uh, by by God's work um, makes it such that if you follow those objective moral truths, you will be rewarded with eternity, infinite pleasure in heaven, or consequently infinite lack of pleasure in hell. Which may I'm not sure whether that was a, necess a necessary addition to your argument, but you could say that's an additional kind of boost to that moral system. It would be. But I'm kind of wondering why it needs to be a personal God. Because you can't just define God as being those objective moral truths. It has to be a person, it has to be a, a mm. conscious being. But yep. could you not have a mechanical universe where those objective moral truths exist and indeed rewards you with heaven or comes you with hell without any kind of personal yeah, I mean, there are, there are possible alternatives. I'm just saying they're quite difficult to find. And uh, they sound so speciously like God when you come down to it. So the, the, um, the expansive uh, uh, naturalists now who are, include um, quite a number of philo philosophers in Britain um, come up with the objectivity of values. So values actually exist, and they're prepared to say uh, that values exist, which Samuel Blackburn in Cambridge would say is an absurd thing to say. But if you say values actually exist, you do, yeah, that you, you then have to have an ontology of some sort. How are you going to work this into? You can't work it into a purely old-fashioned naturalistic view where the things that exist are all in space and time, because values aren't in space and time. So you're already into a supernatural world, right? where natural means scientifically establishable. And that word supernatural frightens people, but it just means there are values out there. And, and uh, so I just think theism, uh, I'm, I'm gunning for theism, I'm, I'm defending theism as, as one coherent way of uh, instating values in the world. And incidentally, I don't think the point is that you get an infinity of pleasure out of doing good, but that you you bring about a greater good in the world. It will be successful. Things are not just going to get worse. You know, the Bertrand Russell thing, well, what the hell, because the world's going to end anyway and nothing else will happen. And so nothing matters ultimately. Right? And the lots of people who take that view, not all atheists have to, but I find it hard to find a good defense against that view. Thanks, Keith. Any more questions? You were going to ask both. Yeah, sorry, I have one question. But I oh, take exactly. one. Um, can we jump yeah, in and we'll jump back? Uh, yes. This oh. Madam over here. Thanks. Um, it's a really interesting debate. Um, I wanted to take up one of your uh, later points about... So, I take that if if you have an atheistic view of the world and you feel that it is a sort of scary thought that if you just choose to do... If you only do what's good because you choose to, then it's a scary thought that you could just choose not to. And yeah. that... You know, so if there's no moral, if there's no right. objective grounding within this, you could just right. choose not to. And that is a scary thought. But So I think your response to that was that the belief in God in an objective grounding for morality is what uh, counters that and is what would make somebody say, okay, I won't just choose something else because I have this belief. Is that is it accurate? To okay, go on. Yeah. yeah, so um, if that is the case, then this isn't specifically linked to the stakes of this debate, but... If that is a theistic position, the link between a belief in God and the ontological existence of God, do you, do you need the latter, or could you just say that a belief in oh. objective morality <laughs> is all you need? Like, do you need the actual God above that? Well, um, yeah. Uh, when I have a belief, it's be I believe that something is true. <laughs> so I, I need the objective. But does the truth uh, I need matter? Does it matter? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, one of the defences I would give of theistic morality is that it means that moral truth is something to be sought and discovered, whereas it, it's quite widely held in the world of moral philosophers that there's nothing to discover. You make your preference, and you try to make it rational, of course, but you're not discovering something that's true. Okay, It's really quite a deep question. And I'm not saying theism is the only way to make moral assertions true. I'm just saying it's a very coherent resource that a lot of atheists, well, actually they do have. I, I agree that these naturalists, uh, expansive naturalists, are atheists, but um, that's because they don't understand God very well. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that it's perfectly, when, uh, it's perfectly possible to have 
moral discoveries, I, I pick up a point on what, um, what Freddie Ayer would have say, said, although I don't uh, agree with his meta-ethical worldview, that most moral debate that we have is, is disagreement about descriptive facts, right? We're not, descript we're not disagreeing about the actual kind of normative function, right? If somebody's arguing that we should do one thing or should do another, the argument is, well, well, this will bring about this, and this will bring about this, but if you do this, this will happen. You, you're not actually de like debating the, the moral principle underneath. Uh, and so I think that like all you need to have kind of moral progression, moral discovery, is one principle which you can then kind of discover which modes of actions will mm. bring about that principle, right? So I, I think yeah. it's perfectly possible to have that kind of moral discovery on a on a right. on a uh, atheistic worldview, and yeah. even harder to have it on a religious worldview if that religious worldview um, has kind of lists of morality and sets of morality that it puts forward as true. Yeah. Um, then there's kind of no discovery to be made. It's more just kind of received. Yeah. I mean that's one of the pathologies of religion that some religious people think everything's been said in some text or by some mm. person and you just have to obey it without thinking. That's pathological, whoever says that. Uh, but the thought that uh, there is something to be discovered and people might change their minds actually <laughs> yeah. um, uh, is, uh, is an important one. So what we're agreed upon is that there are atheists with bad moral views and Christians and with bad moral views and other religious people with bad moral sure. views. But sure. that an atheistic worldview can, even if it might be a bit difficult, grand morality, as can potentially a religious one. No, I don't accept that. I, I think uh, an atheist can certainly have a moral view, and it can be a very, Peter Singer is a good example for me, uh, a very moral person. Uh, but well. he, I mean, I've talked to Peter Singer, and he has no reason for having that moral view. He, that's just his moral view. He calls it a preferential, you know, mm. a, a view. And, and I say, well, what? Most people in the world don't have your preferences, actually. Most people don't want to be vegetarian. You know? yeah, but um, but <laughs> Peter Singer, not being a vegetarian, but a vegan as well. Uh, <laughs> Peter Singer is not talking about his own preferences and, and extrapolating them to other people. In fact, that, that was the meta-ethical view that someone like myself would hold. Peter Singer holds, holds an opposing view, and if, if, you, if you don't think that he has reason to kind of act in accordance with his, his moral views, I mean, he has talked about why he believes that to be the case. Um, uh, including on a, on a podcast episode that's available online <laughs> uh, if you're interested in watching at, at cosmoskeptic.com. I'd be interested because I, I've uh, asked him that question And too. the exact discussion that we had was on this point. Right. right? So I was mm. saying that if we say that pleasure is some, if we kind of see pleasure as a, as a received um, kind of intrinsically normative function, we just, it, pleasure is good for us when, when experienced by definition, right? right. Um, I was saying, well, surely the only way to universalize that is to say that somebody else's pleasure or someone else's, is, is, is someone else's well-being act in accordance with my own preferences, right? But Singer's view is, no, that pl my pleasure is preferable for me, and he extrapolates from that that everybody's pleasure is preferable to everybody, yeah, right? Yeah, right? And so he's actually, I don't think he's doing what you, what you said that he's doing there. Um, I think that he does have reason to ground his morality, and that he does have reason to act out of accordance with his own preferences, uh, and, and commit what, what would yeah. generally be seen as altruistic behavior. But Again, the, like it's an atheistic moral worldview that is coherent and works and provides, a meta, uh, and provides an ethical system that in many ways is superior to uh, a religious worldview that, for instance, thinks it's okay uh, to treat non-humans as, as they like, right? Yeah, and right. I don't need to convince you that it's superior, I just need to convince you that it's plausible and, and the um, motion doesn't carry. Sorry, can I jump to another yeah. question? Okay. Just so everyone's got a chance. Yes, this gentleman right at the back. Um, I think you mischaracterized the burden of proof, and that's why a lot of the debate has looked kind of leaning to your side. You said that his burden is that he has to prove that religion provides a certain fundamental value that atheism doesn't, but the debate isn't that. The debate is that morality, if based on religion, is bankrupt, not if and only if. So what you have to do is prove that um, um, atheistic-based morality can be functional. And what you fail to do th through the debate, in my opinion, is um, provide a value that, that, that provides a reason why people behave um, in a universal sense. As I for example, in utilitarianism, sure, it's great to you maximize my own utility. Why do I, as, as an atheist, need to maximize everyone else's mm -hmm. utility is undefined. For example, in, um, in, in a theistic view of morality, you have that mechanism that is God. God says that you should treat everyone equally. And while I may not agree with that, or while I may think that that is trivially true or false, that's not the debate. The debate is that, athe that atheistic morality needs this mechanism, and I don't see it. Unfortunately, the motion is actually um, morality without religion is bankrupt. 
Um, otherwise, I would agree with you that that is the case, and I can potentially um, do that and try to provide an argument in favour of that, perhaps at the pub afterwards. But that's unfortunately not the motion that we were actually faced with. Can I yeah. Um, yeah, but morality with uh, without religion is bankrupt. Does not entail that morality with religion is not bankrupt. Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. But that's the point I'm trying to make: is that like. You, we can provide a, a perfectly coherent system of ethics based on a religious worldview. That's fine. I've got no qualm with that. The qualm is saying that that is the only possible access to, to, to morality and ethics that we can have, okay, which so I don't think is the case. Something that is atheistic and coherent. Well, I can certainly try to. So can Peter Singer. So can anybody else. Um, but the argument is about kind of atheistic morality as a whole being bankrupt. And as I said in my opening statement, I can provide an atheistic worldview that somebody can then debunk, somebody else can do the same thing that's then debunked, but that can go on forever, right? In order to make the claim that atheistic morality as a whole is bankrupt, you need to show that there is something that is universal to all atheistic system of, mor of morality that universally fails. So it doesn't matter what atheistic worldview I hold to, in the same way that if I wanted to show the reverse motion, if I wanted to show that religious uh, morality was bankrupt, um, Professor Ward could present a, a, a coherent view of religious morality and I could show why I think it, it fails but then we'd just be left to move on to the next religious morality, the next conception of religious morality and that wouldn't be a useful way to debate. I would have to show if I was going to make the claim that actually if you don't, if, if you have a belief in God morality is bankrupt then I'd have to show what it is that's intrinsic to religious belief that brings that about and so if, this, if we're debating that uh, whether, whether we can have atheistic morality without God then I think the same has to be done there. Thank you. Okay, we've probably got time for two more quick questions. Um, Let's go right to the back, to this uh, gentleman oh, right at the back. A new criterion for the greater richness of religious morality, and that's that it's far more coherent than any atheistic morality can ever be. So if we roll back to the example of homosexuality, there are very few people out there who um, would oppose <coughs> homosexuality per se in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, those religious sects that do oppose it emerging out of a coherent... A uh, whole corpus of beliefs on sexual morality. Um, compared to that, uh, the atheistic worldview, in favour or otherwise, would be far more arbitrary, far more dependent upon the individual issue. So, what would your response or consideration of that idea of a more coherent morality be? Firstly, to say that uh, a moral system is atheistic is not to say that it's subjective, is not to say that it's arbitrary. Like uh, say, saying that because you don't have religion to ground your morality in, your religion is therefore arbitrary, that's not the case. You can have objectivist moral theories outside of religion. You can also have subjectivist um, morality outside of religion that is not arbitrary. I'd also say that if a view emerges from a corpus of coherent moral thought, but the thing that emerges is something which we would consider abominable, then perhaps we've got reason to question the corpus that it came from. Um, if I have a system of morality that says that if you want to do something in your own private time and I shouldn't have anything to say about it, that's okay. And if you have another corpus that says, well, yes, I think it's wrong to be a homosexual, but that's because of all of this kind of reasoning. It's like, okay, well, you're welcome to whichever one you like, but I think that mine is not only coherent but superior in that respect. Thank you. One more quick question to finish. Right, so let's go to this gentleman here. Hi, thank you very much, both for the debate. Um, I think it's quite interesting how sort of the discussion, this is a question for Alex, sorry. Um, I think it's interesting how the discussion is really centered around the is or problem. And I, f I do believe it's a big problem, and I feel like neither party has really given a, a solution to the problem. Um, but maybe I can humbly suggest a sort of theistic answer to that problem. Um, so, uh, typically a theistic response to, you know, why does the universe exist, i.e. why are there is facts, is, you know, God created the universe. Um, and, and the atheistic answer is, might be to say, uh, well, there was a big bang, and that is just because, well, you know, the universe is, and that's a basic fact. Um, and equally, on t in terms of ought, the theist could just say, well, in the same way that God can make is facts to be true, he can make or he can make ought facts to be true because he's God. He can make things. He can make statements true. Um, in that case, uh, the, the the atheist might say, "Well, then I'm allowed to say, uh, well, there are just objective moral truths. They just exist, just like the universe exists." Mm -hmm. um, but then I think that the atheist is left with quite a big problem, which you might call a sort of moral design problem, in that 
given that uh, you know the uh, why should human beings have a special place in the universe? Why why does do, why do moral truths seem to be personal personal like you know love your neighbour as yourself or you know uh, don't intrude on other people's freedom? Um, why do the moral truths take uh, that kind of sort of form where the theist has a very good answer for that, i.e., you know, God's a personal being, um, and he, for example, in the Christian worldview, he exists in a trinity of loving persons, for example. Mm -hmm. so um, that'd be interesting to see what. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I'd point out is that, as, as you say, the atheist can just respond, well, I'm allowed to do it too. And if, if they are allowed to do that, which I don't really necessarily think that they are, but if they are allowed to do that, then by virtue of something being this kind of of this mysterious quality of moral truth, um, then it would just be the case that it is that it is moral and personal and all, all of this kind of stuff. And you could ask, like, well, where the hell did that come from? But again, you could ask the same as somebody who just says that, that God created it, right? Both questions need to be answered and perhaps can be answered. My, my point, though, would be to say that, yes, God can create propositional truths, um, hypothetically, um, or, or, or produce the universe, whatever it may be. But to say that God is able to make uh, ought statements true We've got to think about what we mean by the nature of an ought statement. To me, an ought statement contains um, something of a, of a command, right? Saying you ought to do something is like, go and do this with some kind of reservations. I, I would, uh, so for instance, my ethical understanding of the word ought would actually be that saying you ought to do this is equivalent to saying that in the absence of other considerations, go and do this. That's kind of what ought means, right? To, uh, but, and, and you can take that view, or you can take a view that says that it has some kind of command function in it. The problem is that commands can't be true or false. Right, saying go over there, saying love your neighbor, saying do not murder, that can't be true or false. So I think that kind of in principle, if we allow that to be a kind of uh, a part of any kind of ought statement, then in principle, we cannot allow that to just be made true even by an omnipotent being because it's just, it's incoherent. That's not the kind of thing that is subject to truth or falsehood, if you see what I mean. I don't know if you've got anything to say on that. No, but I would concentrate on the word good rather than the word ought. I'm sure you would, but yeah, th that's, the, that's the easier part, right? That's the well, I've done that it's easier, but um, uh, you, you, it's, uh, it's certainly true that statements about something being good can be true or false. They are truth family. Sure, I, I, so. I'm happy to grant that, but then yeah. we, we, we'd be back to the discussion we had earlier, which is that I can grant that something is good, but the question about morality, which is more than just identifying qualities of the universe, it's more than just pointing at something and saying that this is good, it's like, well, what, what does that mean? What, what does that mean I have to do? To be morality, you need the normative function of saying, this is good, so you ought to do it. And that so is where the essence of this debate lies, I think. Until we have that so, we have no reason to trust the moral system that's being presented. I think that's a very good question to end on. Let's all give, give our speakers a round of applause.